Thank you so much, Rosie, for that intro. And um, uh, Alex spoke movingly about the tropical rainforest of the world, and it's my um, absolute pleasure and honor to be here in the temperate house at Kew Gardens to talk to you about temperate rainforests, because yes, Britain really does have its own rainforests. So let's delve into them. I wanted to start with this image. It's not actually a photo. It's actually a watercolor, uh, a watercolor painting by a wonderful artist uh, an illustrator called Alan Lee, and it's the front cover of my book. Uh, and Alan Lee is probably best known for being the illustrator of the works of Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, and so on. And um, Alan Lee was uh, an absolute childhood hero of mine. As I was growing up, I used to pore over uh, the illustrated copies of The Hobbit and uh, this book he'd illustrated on fairies and goblins and tried to kind of copy his wonderful artworks, uh, completely in vain, of course, because he is an absolute genius. Um, and, um, and then later in life, I moved to, to Devon. So about three years ago, I moved to Devon um, and started exploring the fringes of, of Dartmoor and seeing some wonderful wet woodlands that I started to understand as being temperate rainforests. Then I looked back at the artworks uh, that in, in Alan Lee's books uh, and, and looked at things like Fangorn Forest and Mirkwood and all of these wonderful dripping trees covered with mosses illustrating the, the forests of Middle Earth. And I thought, hang on a minute, these look very similar to the woods that I'm seeing, the temperate rainforest I'm seeing um, on the outskirts of Dartmoor. And lo and behold, it turned out that Alan Lee lived also uh, on the edge of Dartmoor. He'd moved to Chagford in the 1970s, which is a bit of a, a hub of fantasy art, artists, actually. There's loads of people who live there who do fantasy art, which is brilliant. Um, so I went and met him. He, he has a starring role in the book. Um, his uh, art studio is exactly as you would like it. It's, uh, it's like um, Merlin's lair in The Sword in the Stone. It's cut full of, full of skulls and you know, paint everywhere and a little uh, figurine of, of, uh, a tree, of tree beard. And I got to hold Gandalf's staff. So that was pretty exciting. Um, and um, he agreed uh, when I cheekily asked him that he would illustrate the front cover of my book. So never judge a book by its cover except for this one, because it's by far the best thing about it. Um, but to move from fantasy art to reality, because I want to emphasize that Britain really does have rainforests. This is one of them. This is Blacktor Copse on Dartmoor, a wonderful tiny fragment, about 14 acres, of uh, Atlantic temperate rainforest. And you know we're more familiar with, the, with tropical rainforests, with um, the Amazon, uh, the Congo uh, Basin rainforests, the rainforests of Borneo and Indonesia. Um, but we really do also have temperate rainforests around the world. Uh, they're, they're temp tropical, rain tropical rainforests, of course, occur in places where it's rainy but hot, and temperate rainforests occur in places where it's rainy but cool. So the temperate regions of the world, you have, we have them in places like the Pacific Northwest Coast of America. We have them in uh, Japan, in, uh, in, in New Zealand and Tasmania and Chile, and on the Atlantic seaboard of the British Isles. So we have them right here. And what makes a rainforest a rainforest and what makes a temperate rainforest a rainforest is that it's rainy and mild enough for plants to grow on other plants, which we, which we call epiphytes. And you can see examples of them here in Blacktor Copse. Um, the ferns, the mosses, the epiphytes, the, 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 the lichens that are all festooning these sort of octopus-like gnarled branches of these wonderful oak trees. Now, this next photo, um, taken by a proper photographer, not me, uh, Tom Williams, who's a brilliant photographer, um, I wanted to show you this. This is Wisman's Wood. You may well have heard of Wisman's Wood, um, probably the most wonderfully atmospheric of our fragments of temperate rainforest in England. And I wanted to show you this because uh, of, of how atmospheric it is in two senses, I think. It, it, you know, every temperate rainforest that I've ever had the honor to visit has inculcated in me this sense of awe, this enchantment, this sense of mystery. Um, but also I wanted to show you this picture because of the very real atmosphere that you get, the physical atmosphere you get within temperate rainforests, because they also uh, can generate their own microclimates. They are, you know, under the shade of the canopy, they are cooler than the, uh, the outside, uh, the, uh, the, the habitats outside. You can see this is on a particularly rainy, misty day uh, in Wisman's Wood. And um, the problem is, is that Wisman's Wood, like many of our fragments of rainforest, is absolutely minute. It's only about eight acres. Um, and you know, the, outside, the rest of Dartmoor, anybody who's been there who's, who knows it, will, you will know that it's a very, very treeless place indeed. But perhaps it didn't always used to be that way. Um, 
Let's talk about the epiphytes that characterize and really make our temperate rainforest special because we have hundreds of species of rare lichens and mosses that exist in this habitat in Britain. And sometimes they can completely festoon trees like this one here in Pileskops, the third of uh, Dartmoor's Atlantic oakwoods that still survive. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite lichens on Dartmoor, a string of sausages lichen, or Usnea articulata, one of the beard lichens. And it's gone absolutely wild here. Um, but not doing anything to harm the tree. It's epiphytic rather than parasitic, um, but just looks absolutely fantastic, like a kind of Christmas tree covered in tinsel. And if you really want to get into identifying temperate rainforests, I'm afraid you have to become, uh, as I've become over the last few years, a very amateur but absolute geek about lichens. <laughs> um, lichens, I think, are one of our most overlooked species or, or set of species uh, in, in, in this country. We, we absolutely abound in them. Um, and this is one of the most charismatic now, why do I say charismatic? Well, we hear a lot about charismatic megafauna in conservation, people talking ab about how lions and tigers and bears are these charismatic beasts that we should be looking after and preserving. And of course we should, absolutely. But they are really only the apex of the food pyramid, of the food chains. Actually, I think we also need to be caring a whole lot more about some of those other parts of biodiversity, those species that Alex mentioned earlier, such as the lichens, the mosses, the bryophytes that characterize our, our very own temperate rainforest here. This, I think, is one of the most charismatic you get in this country. It's called Labaria pulmonaria, tree lungwort, and it gets its rather unsavoury name from the medieval doctrine of signatures, the idea in medieval herbology that basically plants and fungi and other creatures resembled the bits of the human body that they were meant to cure. In this case, lungs, because I suppose if you scrub your eyes and look at it closely, it does look a little bit like the sacs of al alveoli within if you cut open a human lung. Um, and so medieval herbologists would, would, herbalists would, would um, prescribe it for pulmonary diseases, hence pulmonaria in the scientific name. I should stress, there is absolutely no scientific evidence that I'm aware of, although I'd love to hear Q's view on this, that it actually cure, cures any sorts of such uh, pulmonary diseases. And so for that reason, if nothing else, do not pick the lichens. But much more, much more importantly, uh, we should just respect these creatures and these species for their own sake rather than their instrumental value. And this, this one is particularly rare these days because of over-exploitation in the past and because of air pollution. Two more wonderful weird denizens of our temperate rainforests. Um, another lichen here, this one is called Sticta sylvatica. It may not be quite so much to look at as Labaria, but uh, it certainly is something to smell if you've ever come across it in, in, the, in the woods and given it a little gentle rub, it smells of rotting fish. And this, however, is my favorite of all. It's not a lichen or a moss at all, but it's uh, a fungus, it's hazel glass fungus, which gets its name from the fact that it grows often on old, uncoppiced hazels, <clears throat> where the wood is kind of decaying, <clears throat> excuse me, and it actually parasitizes another fungus. Um, There's a fungus eat fungus world out there. Um, and obviously it sort of it gets its name from the, its resemblance to sort of some little mittens or gloves wrapping itself around hazel, hazel trees. One conservationist once described it to me as looking like Donald Trump's tiny orange hands. <laughs> or possibly another part of Donald's anatomy. But don't let that put you off uh, searching out for it in our temperate rainforests. Now I've talked a bit about the ecological importance of our temperate rainforest, but I also think they're really, really important historically and culturally, and I think that's something really important to recognize and to see, see that we are part of nature, as Alex said earlier. We are connected to nature and previous societies have perhaps been more inspired and perhaps more, lived more in harmony and in tune with, with the rest of nature. Um, and um, in researching my book, I, I started rereading um, some of the wonderful myths and legends contained in uh, the Mabinogion, which is the um, ancient book of a uh, collection of ancient uh, Welsh Celtic myths and legends, first written down probably around a thousand years ago, but based on an arguably much older oral Bardic Celtic tradition. And you start reading it, and actually you can see the Atlantic oakwoods of Wales right there throughout it, forming this backdrop to these wonderful magical tales. Even the first four books of the Mabinogi are called the first, the four branches of the Mabinogion. And that in itself suggesting the, the, the sense of a tree that permeates these wonderful legends. There's, um, I'll only tell you one or two about these because I don't have time within 15 minutes. But um, 
there's a character, one of the heroes of the Mabinogion called Gwydion, a shape-shifting wizard who has these incredible powers of being able to take bits of the natural world and form them and shape them into other things. And the name Gwydion actually means born of trees. And Gwith in Welsh is closely associated between, it means sort of wood and sort of thought or knowledge, has this sort of sense that you gain consciousness from understanding the world around you, which I think is, is very true. And um, Gwydion, in one of the, the legends, the stories of the Mabinogion, he takes the flowers of the oak and the flowers of the broom and the flowers of the meadow sweet, and he conjures a woman out of them, and he names her Bloodoweth. And Bloodoweth means both flowers and owls. And there's this wonderful whole story about that, which also makes its way into Alan Garner's The Owl Service, if you've ever read that. It's a wonderful book as well. And one last story here, which I'll tell you, which is that... Um, so this is, these are obviously other wonderful watercolours by the artist Alan Lee. Um, and this one on the side here with this wonderful beardy chap is Treebeard, the Ent, um, from the Two Towers, Tol Tolkien's The Two Towers. But I think Tolkien was actually inspired to draw, but, but inspired um, by one of the ancient Welsh myths when he wrote about the last march of the Ents upon, uh, the, upon Isengard when the... When the Tree, uh, when Treebeard summons the Ents of Fangorn Forest to defend the forest from being cut down by um, the evil wizard Saruman, arguably a, a parable about uh, deforestation for industry, because he's using it to kind of uh, fire, fire up in industry and create all these weapons of war. And so Treebeard being one of the early environmentalists. But actually, it's based on an even older legend, which is the Battle of the Trees, the Cad Godai. Um, uh, in the book of Taliesin and it's this amazing story about how Gwydion again summons up the, his magical powers, the powers of the rainforest and animates an entire forest to go into battle against the forces of the other world this sort of wonderful march of the trees so I think it's really important to, to recognise that, that how other cultures have seen and been inspired by our rainforests and how we can be as well so where do we find our temperate rainforest? So I've given you a sense already. It's in places that are, are wet and mild enough for them to be supported. And this is an attempt uh, by, by myself and a, and a professional GIS map maker, digital map maker called Tim Richards, to draw a map of where we find, might find our, our best habitats in Britain for temperate rainforest. It's based on some work that was done by the academic Christopher Ellis at um, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. Uh, and we just simply tried to update some of his amazing work by using more recent Met Office uh, rainfall records and temperature records to see where we might find the best climatic envelope for temperate rainforest to thrive. And lo and behold, it's in the west of Britain, going down from uh, Argyle and the Scottish Highlands and Mull and down through uh, the Lake District and uh, Erri and in Snowdonia and Wales and down through to the West Country. And that's an area of Britain that's around about 20% of the landmass. But the actual rainforest that survives in those areas, the ancient woodlands that still cling on in those parts of the country, are considerably less than 20%. It's more like 1% that is left. So how did we go from an uh, ecosystem that covered maybe a fifth of Britain to something that's only less than 1% now? Well, the tragedy is that Britain was a rainforest nation, but it's cut down most of its rainforests already. Um, even of that 1% that's left, around three quarters, by our reckoning, of England's temperate rainforests lack legal protection. They're not protected as sites of special scientific interest or triple size. And many of our temperate rainforests and other ancient woodlands suffer from uh, overgrazing on their edges. They're prevented from naturally regenerating and spreading as they would do naturally uh, as a result of um, overgrazing by livestock, particularly, I'm afraid, sheep, this woolly creature here. Um, and because uh, sheep are uh, an introduced species to, to Britain, um, you know, some of our uh, vegetation is not necessarily as adapted to it as, um, as, as in its, where it's local to, and it tends to overgraze and nibble everything down to a very tight sward in terms of grass and it will nibble saplings as well uh, and if you think though that uh, the numbers of sheep that we have in this country are nice and natural and it's all very bucolic and looks lovely I hope this next slide will disabuse you of that notion because this is a map of sheep density in Europe 
and the areas in yellow are low sheep density and the areas in red are high. And as you can see, Britain is truly world beating when it comes to numbers of sheep. So we have a bit of an issue there with when we have to contend with how to reshape um, farm subsidies, how to best incentivize and work with farmers and landowners to perhaps reduce sheep numbers a little and increase the amount of rainforest a little bit more. One last threat that we have to deal with in uh, tackling the um, challenges of our temperate rainforest is the fact that uh, we do have a particularly invasive species that has really, really, really enjoys living in exactly the same climatic area as our temperate rainforest, and that's unfortunately Rhododendron ponticum. This is an area which should be temperate rainforest on Dartmoor, and it's been completely um, overtaken by rhododendron. And at current rates of clearance, um, the current rates of money that the government is putting into uh, encourage people to clear this invasive species, it will take 250 years to eradicate it from England, which we don't have that time. The good news is that when we actually allow nature to regenerate, it can start to spring back remarkably quickly. This is a hillside in Erri, near Cadaridris, in North Wales. On one side, the sheep have been excluded and stopped from grazing. Uh, oh, sorry, on one side, this side, the sheep continue to graze. On the other side, the um, sheep can, have been excluded and, and cannot graze, and a forest is starting to return as a result of natural regeneration of seeds being deposited there by birds, squirrels, other species, and they're doing so under their own willpower. There's no, no need for us to go out with a spade every time and, and, uh, and a sapling and plant them. And although rhododendron is incredibly invasive, there's lots of work going on by dedicated groups, conservation organizations, and teams of volunteers to try and clear it from where it's at. So there is stuff that can be done. And an increasing momentum um, by progressive uh, pioneering landowners and farmers, such as this guy here, Merlin Hanbury Tennyson in Cornwall, through to the Woodland Trust, the National Trust, uh, and lots of other charities as well, who are doing fantastic work to try and protect and restore um, our temperate rainforests. But beyond, ooh, that's not quite loaded properly, but beyond, our, um, beyond the work that we can do with landowners, existing landowners and farmers, we do need political change, policy change as well. And which is why over the last couple of years, I've been working with lots of other people to try and campaign to get the government to do more to protect and restore our rainforests through a rainforest strategy, through increasing the amount of funding that's available uh, for uh, farmers and landowners to restore them and to try and protect uh, those remaining fragments. Um, and, and remove invasive rhododendron from, from their midst. Um, there's a long way to go, so I hope you'll be able to get involved. Um, I feel incredibly lucky and privileged to have been able to see and be inspired by so many of our wonderful fragments of remaining temp temperate rainforest. I hope this short introduction to them has inspired you too and that you get involved in the campaign to bring back Britain's lost rainforests. Thanks very much.